Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Lawyers and Mediators International Show and Podcast from InstantMediation.com, where we discuss law and conflict resolution topics to educate both professionals and everyday people. Please remember, nothing contained in these episodes constitutes legal advice. So please talk to a lawyer as cases are fact dependent. Hi, I'm Mac Pierre Louis, attorney, mediator, and arbitrator. And I am Natalia Ovskotajka, advocate, mediator, and arbitrator. In today's episode, we're talking with Fran Brockstein in a series called Mediation Tips by Fran. And the topic for today's episode is pro se patterns seen in family law mediations after three decades. So let me introduce Fran. So Fran, you've been writing articles for mediations for a while since last year during COVID. And you've been all around mediator for a very, very long time. I got a chance to mediate with you when I was in, in practicing law uh, full time, uh, where you settled lots of cases for me. But I went to Fran back in the day because I knew that she was a reputable long-term attorney who had basically seen everything across many, many years. So Fran, please give us a little one minute synopsis of your career and your background. I'm a native Houstonian. And two years ago, my husband and I moved to the Texas Hill Country. Um, I have lived what I preach. I was an attorney for 30, I am an attorney for 30 years. I worked at used to volunteer lawyers for five years. That was a real education. I then went solo. And many years ago, I decided to become a mediator because I found the cost of litigation and the heartache of litigation was not effective for my clients. Got it. So we wanted to have a discussion with you today about pro se's. This is a theme we've been kind of going through with different speakers, because one thing that we believe is that mediation should be open to as many people as possible so that folks are not just left in the dark, living in the shadows of courts and lawyers, and that there are other options. Instead of just having to call a lawyer's office, you can call a mediator as well and see if they can help you settle your issue even before court. But I can let Natalia take over and uh, ask you the first question. So why do you yourself like mediating with process? What do you find welcoming and good about people who come to you into mediation not knowing uh, much about law itself or not really uh, having any um, experience with mediation or law before? And what do you normally advise to them? Well, on my website, I have a lot of information because I do believe that knowledge is very important and empowering for people. And then before I will schedule any pro se's, I like to talk and or email with both parties to let them know what mediation is. It is not meditation. We're not going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. It is re really the parties control the process. I do not make decisions for them. So I like them to think outside the box. And I am there as a trained mediator professional to assist them in their discussion. But I don't make the decisions. I also use a lot of life experience that either it's ha happened to me, my clients or someone in my family. And I just reality test with people a lot. So Fran, can you give us some of the patterns you've seen over the last number of years? I know, I take it you've kind of seen everything, right? There's nothing that can surprise you or shock you, right? And we're not going to say any names, of course, and, no. and everything is always confidential. But can you kind of give us some themes, things you see regularly over and over again? Well, I never say never because... One reason I love mediation is because you never know what's going to happen at mediation. It's always different. Every family is different. The people are different. And so I try to work with them. What I like about mediation is that I can deal with people's fears, concerns, challenges, where the judges, in and I live in Texas, focus on the law and the fa hard facts that you can prove. And I find that by empowering people, by addressing their fears and their possible concerns, that then they can start to think more clearly and we can work up something that works for their family, especially if they have small children. Because at the end of the day, in Texas, 
even in a long custody fight, say you had a trial or a jury trial for five days, at the end of the day, the judge expects you to go home and co-parent with the other person. So just to follow up, um, do you have, I guess, specific anecdotes or examples of the patterns you see? I know you said never say never because something's going to come up one day that, that you're going to oh, be yeah. shocked by, but anything else? Well, I mean, most people really want what's best for their children. And what I try to explain to people is that if, first of all, I don't believe that parents should share adult business, that's what I call adult business, with their children. And I, my parents divorced when I was in my 30s and a divorce lawyer. And I tell people that come to see me, I don't care if your kid is 3, 13, 23, or 33. There are certain topics you should never talk with your children about. And I use my daughter as an example. She thanked me when she was a senior in high school for never, ever bad-mouthing her father, ever. It was none of her business. And he and I had our issues, but we learned to work together to do what's right for her. And today she is married, a mother, and has a very successful business career. So when we talk about patterns in mediation, uh, you probably know some good patterns and some bad patterns. And of course, we are always looking for those best patterns that you can follow, but maybe you can name some bad patterns. So things that you noticed and can be eliminated or can be avoided so that it works better for the parties and ultimately for the families, since you mainly do the family mediation. Well, I mean, there are some people that just want to punish the other person and they don't even care if they hurt themselves in the process. Those are very difficult mediations. For example, I had a, a couple that she wanted to stay in the house. It had been in her family for a long time. They'd spent a lot of money remodeling it. It was very important to her. And the husband, they could have arranged for her to keep it, but he insisted that the house be sold. And after many tears and a lot of um, crying and really being very upset, she finally agreed to sell the house. And it was really a tragedy in that case. But a lot of times people just want to punish the other spouse. And it's many times it's not necessarily logical. It just is, how dare you leave me? And if, uh, if you're going to leave me, then I'm going to make sure you're punished any way I can, even if it goes around and hurts me in the long run. Hmm. So what about some good patterns then? Something that you think you wish people would do more often? Just this week, I had a young couple with a small child. They're not together. They've moved on. They have other partners now in their life. And they were a pleasure to work with because both of them are reasonable they work together and they put their kid first. And that is so important. And I thank them for the opportunity to work with them because those kind of people are really rewarding to me. I shifted from litigation to mediation because I get a lot more hugs and flowers than I ever got when I litigated and had to take people to court. You said about those hugs and uh, flowers, but now you are mediating online a lot. And have these patterns in mediation changed when you are doing this in the form of online mediation as we in instant mediations are trying to promote all over the world? Listen, when Matt called me at the beginning of COVID, I would never have considered online mediation. And now I have embraced it. It is fabulous. The attorneys like it because they don't have to travel. The clients like it because they can sit at home and be comfortable. I, I still like being in person because I like to read body language. But And I find that online mediation is a little bit slower because I have to ask them a lot of questions because I'm only seeing their face. But no, I embrace it and plan to continue online mediation even after COVID is, God willing, history and gone okay so for the pro se person who might be sitting out there and they're watching they're so listening to the podcast and they're thinking to themselves you know i'm having some you know issues or disputes and i know this is 
uh, predominantly family law that we're discussing today because you're a family law mediator. But you do, by the way, do other mediations outside of family, right? Yes, I've been trained to do it. I've done cars. I've done yeah, lemon lemon law things. Mm. I've done sisters that were fighting. I've done elder law. So basically in mediation, you're trained generally to do any area. I mainly, though, have focused on family law because I was a family law attorney in Texas. Yeah, and you did a, I think you told me you did an NFT or some kind of crypto-based uh, dispute recently? Oh, I've done, yeah, did that with a couple without attorneys. Yes, a very wealthy Houston couple came to me and we resolved their case. They were both very educated, very knowledgeable, and they owned at least five or six businesses, including crypto businesses. And um, they looked at me at the end and said, you know, we interviewed several lawyers. We both talked to lawyers and we know that you saved us easily each $100,000 because if they had gotten into discovery, especially with the crypto, because that's such a new thing and had to hire experts to discuss crypto in court and explain it to a judge, they knew that they would have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees. So we were able in less than four hours to get everything resolved in a loving, caring, dignified way. They both had input. We did negotiate quite a bit and they did some very creative things, but they were going to remain in business together because they were both very successful. They just couldn't be married anymore. So if, so back to, Imagine a pro se person is sitting at home watching this or listening to it, and they're wondering to themselves, you know, I got a problem, a legal problem, or potential legal problem, because they're not in court yet, right? Yeah. What do you think, based on your experience and your expertise over the years, what do you think they should be considering when they go away, whether or not they should just go call a lawyer and go to a lawyer's office and see if they can just go to court versus calling you or any mediator? Okay. Many years ago, I wrote an article about when to call a lawyer. And my comment and the get takeaway was, if you think you have a problem, call someone now. Don't wait until it's a major problem. The same with mediation. Investigate it early. I offer a free consultation for Texas residents to see if I'm even a good fit for them. I have had people call me and what they think mediators do and what we actually do in Texas are two totally different things. And so if that happens, then I suggest that they do some either research. And in Texas, we have texaslawhelp.org. It's a very good website that's free. Or I suggest they call lawyers in their county to find someone that can help them because mediation is not appropriate for everyone on everything. When our parties, possible parties to mediation, when we mediate, think about mediation, they are usually incentivized to do that because either judges during the court proceedings send them to mediation or the attorneys say, okay, consider the mediation because it's time to do that. But how about people coming to you before they even engage themselves in, this, in a court dispute? Do you think that it's beneficial to them? Would the uh, signed in mediation agreement be binding on the parties if it comes to the dispute later on? I have done it where they're still living together. They haven't separated to other people that have been separated for, say, 20 years. So they're all over the place. But. I do encourage people to do, especially in Texas, to research Texas law so that they know current law. Many people have these strange beliefs I've never heard of, such as in Texas, that if you live together seven years, you have a common law marriage. That is not true. It has they never have been that in true. Poland too. So, you know, it's like an overall universal belief. Please continue. Uh, no. And so, again, a lot of what I do I always, even when I litigated, I always said, I offer a free consultation because hopefully I will depress you so much, you will then try to make your marriage or your relationship work. Then if it doesn't work, then come see me. So again, I let the parties determine it. I have some people that just want to come meet with a neutral for four hours 
and talk. And again, they control the discussion. I may throw in some my own input or ask questions, but they control the process. And then um, other people have come to me. They want to do a temporary order to, for the few months to see, especially if they have kids, to see how it's going to be when they're not together anymore. Then we might meet again in six months, modify them, do it another six months, and let the people get used to moving on with their lives, being alone, learning to co-parent, and still work with their kids. So I have done a lot of things really way outside the box, and that's what I enjoy doing. So let's get a little practical for a second. We've got about five minutes left. Okay. Just wanted to um, help the folks out there think through what is possible because sometimes folks may have, uh, if people don't do this every day, like we do, they may not know what's possible. Okay. Or, or they may have expectations that are so wild that nobody can meet them. Okay. They come to mediation with the ideas or thoughts about what can happen. And the other side is like, uh, I'm not going to agree to that. Okay. So typically, practically, what do you typically see in family law mediations specifically? Are you like, let me give you an example. I would probably do a mediation where a couple comes, they're separated for you know a number of months, a very fresh separation. They may have one or two children. They may have a house together and they are in limbo about whether or not they want a divorce. They may actually, they may want to work things out. However, maybe one of them is filed for a divorce. Or one of them is about to file for the divorce. And then we move on to then discussing issues about the children. We were discussing issues about the property. And then it ends up, it ends itself with either a temporary order or a final order. And then they live supposedly happily ever after based on that order. Is that something that happens every single day in your kind of cases or are there other scenarios that you typically see? Well, a lot of people expect the mediator to in Texas to do their legal paperwork. I am not allowed to do that. And if any mediator says I will do the final decree of divorce or the final suit affecting parent child relationship, run. That is not an ethical mediator. So I have developed a relationship with Texas attorneys that will do the paperwork for people for a reasonable price. And, you know, again, um, every one, every family is different. I've done cases where we have seriously ill, ill children, or I've done cases with couples where one lady was at MD Anderson and basically just wanted enough money to go move in with her sister in Phoenix because she knew she had less than six months to live. And a lot of what I did in all of those kind of cases is talk to the people and try to explain what was really going on. A lot of times what happens is people want the other spouse to go away, but everything to stay the same. They want the money to come in. They want everything to be the way it was, but just let the other spouse just not die, but just go away. And it doesn't work that way. So I could say to people from my own experience, you know, if you work really hard, you can become a much better person. And if you're the best person you can be, that actually benefits your children and your family and yourself. Fran, this has been fabulous to have you with us. We can continue like that <laughs> for the entire time. And we hope to have you with us very soon. To, that was the initial part of the series we created. And we thank you so much for being with us and for sharing your absolute fabulous knowledge on the Texas law and your practice. So once again, that was the first of our series with Fran. Um, this one was on process patterns seen in family law mediation after three decades, but the entire series called Mediation Tips with Fran. Thank you once again and see you in the next um, episode. And for those who listen and tune in, please be sure that we will be there. And if you want to uh, re-listen or um, 
stay tuned. Just visit instantmediations.com or I'll use the Instant Mediations app. See you soon. Bye-bye. And real quick before we take off, um, you can also check out Fran's past articles published on SMediation.com where she has been writing for many months about mediations, online mediations, and mediations particularly geared towards mediators and how they can become better at their craft as they help people around the country. All right. Thanks so much, Fran.